Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. We are back with a webinar with Ida Hammer. I'm so excited to be back. And so we're just going to let her take it away, and we're going to talk about hoof wear patterns. Hey, good to be back, Wendy. Hi, guys. <clears throat> I'm Ida. Sorry about all the like bumbling around before, but we're ready to go now. So Wendy and I wanted to, we just like kind of brainstorm really quick last night for a quick uh, impromptu webinar. So I, it's never gets old to talk about the hoof wear patterns and what we do with them. And um and why I'm like I wanted to put this as a webinar as far as like why it's required for certification and it's actually suggested for all the horse owners so so that's that's the scoop and the the bit about why we picked this one for tonight so I, I'm gonna go to the next screen I think yep there we go yep. so what can cause wear patterns to change so I'm gonna go back first and explain why I even started this class because um. Uh, quite a like lots of years ago uh when i was in i was trimming a it was a french belgian she's a dressage horse and i was trimming her and she always had the most perfect feet ever i'm like they was symmetrical there was never any issues i'm like it was it just it, she was perfect but i trimmed her every four weeks and i went to trim, do the regular trimming cycle and her back feet both of her hind feet were worn off laterally the owner wasn't there and so I had, um, I'd called the owner and asked her, you know, what happened with her horse, what was going on, like what she changed. And she goes, nothing, everything's the same. I'm like, something's changed. And even if it seems, it seems insignificant, like, what is it? She goes, the only thing I know is that I changed my saddle. I got a new saddle. I said, what well, doesn't fit? Because um, it changed everything about the way the, the horse travel and it caused wear pattern changes on her hind feet. So um, I said, well, I don't think it fits because like she's got significant changes to her feet that that were not like that before. And so she had the saddle re re reflocked and refitted and stuff and like in, it, in the wear patterns went back to normal. So my whole point about all that was, and that was, that's gosh, that's like, so, and I always, I laugh when I say these kind of things because it sounds like I'm ancient, which I might be borderline, but I'm like, this is back, <laughs> this is back before, um, like we didn't have the cell phone cameras and like if we wanted to take pictures of something we were just one step above polaroids <laughs> so so you know this is back a long time ago so but i thought how important it was that if i would have not have mentioned that or noticed it or mentioned it that probably what would have happened is the horse would have gotten in more pain maybe gotten bucky because she was a young horse so she might have gotten ill behaved over it and like and the horse would have gotten blamed for being bad or that she have ended up with hawk problems or sacral problems or like on up the on up the the body. It's like it would have something would have happened. So ever since that day, I'm like I have said, you know, prehab beats rehab. So if you can if you can notice something that changes, it's a compensatory change, and you can quite possibly be able to stop it before it's a lameness. And so this is why I think every person every person should be aware of their hoof wear patterns and understand what could be changing them. And every, I'm like in all of my graduates, I'm like, it's a required class for certification. So, because uh, I always tell them when they come to take the class, I'm like, um, this class makes you question everything. It should make you question everything. And please don't leave to be a neurotic, but I'm like, but be, uh, be, be aware of everything that could be changing. So the things that can change wear patterns, you know, when you look at things and, and you don't know, you don't know, it's like, you know, you just don't know what, what could be, but you have an idea of what they're the regular hoof wear is especially if you take pictures now because there's no there's no excuses now that you don't take pictures because it's just simple as a, a cell phone although i'm not i'm probably the worst person to take pictures i'm like i usually get in get started and then i forget but but there's no excuse why you can't um make a note of how the horse has the wear pattern so saddle fit is the first one on the list because that's why i started the class so it's, it's like not the most common thing but it is a common thing oh that happens. actually it's much more common than you think yes yes it, i that's why i started the whole thing it's like in four weeks time it changed like she, like she had perfectly symmetrical hooves and the whole lateral side was worn off like um so it's like from noon to six i'm like there was no two o'clock and uh, or no uh or no 10 o'clock so it's like uh, it was going just over like a month it was a month total and how many times i don't know that she probably wrote her maybe four four times a week so it was enough to change her wear patterns and then what happens though is it's not just when the saddle's on it's like if you make sore muscles and you start a whole uh, uh train of events so the saddle's on, they start compensating while the saddle's on, then that makes something else hurt and that makes something else hurt. And so the next thing you know, you have a whole 
whole train wreck of, of com compensatory patterns. So if we can be aware of anything that changes and, and like, we're not going to always know, we're not going to always know what it is, but it's like, it's like, I like the puzzle. And I'm like, and I try to get the owners, most of my owners are pretty much into that too. It's like, let's figure out what has changed. Like, so we'll go down a list. So rider issues. So let me get to the next one. So I kind of go back and forth between this list. So rider issues are another one. So I, I just, I use this picture in my class, but so if the horse starts having weird wear patterns um, at all, like I, I go through a list of questions about if anything changed, you know, what changed, like um, if nothing has changed, I'll ask them how they're feeling. I'm like, does anything hurt? Does, you know, you having any issues, anything? And more than more times than not, if the owner is having an issue, the horse has a weird, weird, weird wear pattern almost consistently with the rider's issue. Can I say something about this rider picture? Yep. Okay, so so when you look at that picture, everybody thinks the weight's on the right hand side, but the pressure's on the left hand side. Yep, I would agree. So the pressure uh, is not where the weight is, and this is the problem with uh, people trying to figure out. You know, oh, my horse is like tight in the left shoulder. Yeah, he's tight in the left shoulder because the rider's weight is to the right, and therefore the pressure's on the left side of the withers and shoulder. So yep. that's going to compromise, and so it's not a, uh, it's not intuitive. Most people think, oh, the weight's over to the right, so therefore the problem's going to be on the right. Nope, it's going to be on well, the left. I would have to. To be honest, I'd have to say I would have before working with you, uh, like we've done lots of stuff and lots of visiting and, and different workshops and stuff together. And I'm like, I would have been inclined to think the same thing. I would have thought before, you know, before traveling the path that and got, getting to work with the people that I have, I would have thought, oh, this, the rate, the weight is on the right. Because when you look at it, I'm like from somebody that's not, doesn't get to know it. When you look at it, you're thinking the weight's on the right. So you're pushing the weight on the right. And so then you think that's where it is, but um, it isn't. It's the, opposite. It's the thing that's yeah. stopping you from falling off is where the pressure is. So, yes. so that's really, uh, so I'm trying to use my pointer, but it's okay. So if the rider's weight is to the right and the horse leans right, then the pressure's on the left side of the withers. Because if you didn't have a withers, you'd be on the ground. Yep. Well, but it's kind of cool. horses with no withers are more balanced. <laughs> well, it's, um, it's kind of cool. If you guys have ever got a chance to see Wendy work with her, um, she did this without the the um, mechanical horse in Washington. You were doing it with people sitting on the um, the saddle chair, and uh, oh, yeah. and uh, if you guys ever get a chance, so I'm like, this is a little plug for Wendy for a second, but I'm like, and I tell people all, all about these the surefoot clinics that Wendy does. They're about surefoot and they're awesome, but she does other things besides just the surefoot, and you never know what you'll get because it's there's so much to be had. So. <laughs> and so like we put the I saw quarter her. in and let it roll <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but what it brought this picture brought me to that though because it was like at one of the classes that you did you had your saddle chair and you had people sit in it and um and would have them actually shift their weight and and it was uh they were everybody was stunned when they shifted their weight how unsteady they were until you showed them how to to repair that Anyway, that was a small tangent, but you know, if you guys are used to me or <laughs> Ada says I'm advertising now. So, but um, if you're used to Wendy and I at all, you'll know that we may do a tangent or two. It's, yeah. it's, it's not an unusual thing. Not a bad thing. <laughs> so, okay. So anyways, so a lot of times if you have a writer that's having an issue, I, I had a guy um, and he wasn't even my client, but he was a friend of my client and we were down and Southern Illinois, and we were on a trail ride and, and all of his horses are, were lame. And his, his friend was kept asking me, can you look at his horses? Can you look at his horses? Cause they're, none of them's right. And I said, well, yeah, I'm like, I can. And so he came to lunch with us that day. And so I was asking him, I'm like, do you have any issues? He goes, I don't know what the problem is. All my horses are lame. And I'm like, okay. I said, do you have any issues that could be causing any of it? And he goes, no, I feel good. And I said, nothing hurts on you nothing at all and he goes no he's like I, it's just all my horses are lame I'm like okay so we had finished lunch we went riding that afternoon and he was in front of us and the whole time he's standing in a saddle turned like he's going to say something to me and I said did you want to say something he goes no and I said are you getting ready to say something and he said no and I said why are you riding like you're getting ready to talk to me he goes because my hip's killing me this is how I have to ride and like 
I thought you said you didn't have any body problems. That's why all of his horses were lame. I'm like, he rode on a twist the whole time. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> but sometimes people are so used to their body being broken that they don't know it is. Yes. Yes. So That's very, he, very true. He didn't realize that. I'm quite aware of my body being broken. So <laughs> <laughs> right now you're in repair. I, I am. Yes. So I'm going to pop back to the previous one. So bridal fit is something that people don't think about can cause weird wear patterns, but absolutely it can cause weird wear patterns. And so I'm not saying this is every situation. I'm saying that when you're making a quiz to someone about why their wear patterns are different, go through everything you can think of. I'm like every single thing that you can possibly think of, bridal fit can make a difference. I'm like if the horse is not comfortable with the bridle or if it's too tight, if they can't move their tongue right, that's squishing their tongue, if it's anything. I'm like it can be too tight on their pole. It can be just not comfortable. It could zing their teeth and it can cause them to not want to, to travel the same. So. And, it, and what people don't realize that's so important is that very often they have too long a cheek piece and it puts the buckle right up on the TMJ or, and then the crown piece a little bit tight. So now you've got pressure around the front, of the, the front of the head and then from the buckles on the side. And some people have these really big conchos and things that can also be putting pressure on that TMJ. So ideally your buckles are down below the TMJ, more on the cheek line rather than right up on the TMJ because you know there's so many nerves up there that are coming out. You've got your trigeminal and your vagus and it's it's a, you can put pressure on them, cause problems. It does. It is, it's crazy too. And, and it's just one of those things that people are like, well, how can something on their head be causing them to have this weird thing? And so this is, this is the point I'm like, and I tell them by the time people leave the class, they're like, okay, so now I'm a paranoid mess. And I'm like, well, that wasn't my point. And my point is not to make you neurotic, but it's to make you aware and to just never, never stop questioning anything because it could be something small that you don't even know. And it's not like, it's the worst thing on the earth. You just have to figure it out and change it. Right. So um, other things that can make um, weird wear patterns are injuries. I'm like, and, and injuries can be blatant. They can be a traumatic injury that you know, or like in all seriousness, the horses could be out scrolling around in the pasture together, do a slip slide. You don't know it, and but, but they're going to start compensating over it. And so you don't know that they did anything because like they just were playing and, you know, and, and it just it's no different than us. How many times you'll hop up out of your chair, <coughs> excuse me hop up out of your chair maybe you sat down wrong or something and like and you tweak something and so like for several steps you're walking kind of weird and then if you don't rectify it then you continue to walk weird and the same things happen with the horses so like don't rule out injuries and so this next one the scroll adhesions is a huge piece and so this is another piece that um got me going with this class because this happened to one of our horses um Playboy, who is the famous spokesperson for the Mackinac Dales 2 trimming. <laughs> but um, when we got him, I trimmed him before he was ours. And so I, I've trimmed him since he's four. And um, and we got him because he's pretty and Ada liked him. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, that's the whole story about Playboy. But ever since, like when I was trimming him for the owner, she's a wonderful owner. She did everything she knew how to do. But he always, on his right rear foot, he always had a weird wear pattern. And he had that wear pattern from the time I met him. So that, to me, was his normal wear pattern because he wasn't he wasn't off. He wasn't anything noticeable. But um, she was always complaining about how he was a nightmare to fit his saddle. He was, you know, like, the, like he just wasn't an easy, easy guy to fit things for. And so um, when he came to live here, we got to get him because he's, he's metabolic and he, we watch his diet very closely, but she had a lot of pasture and she's afraid that she's going to founder him. And she knew how much Ada loved him. So we bought him <laughs> and he's a super cool horse. I'm like, he does do the spokes, spokes, all the spoke spokesperson for the, the trimming here. But so well, I won, like when he first came here, I hopped on him bareback because I just wanted to figure out why he was rolling saddles off to his right. And so when I, he would walk, I'm like, he would, he would actually roll his right shoulder. And I still didn't know what, what was going on with him. I had no clue still, but he was very accurate at his gait because they always invited him to do the fox trotting demos at the Illinois horse fair. I'm like, he was like top of his game with how, how well he gated. So he was very good at compensating. So then one day I'm like, this, this is a little too much information in one point, but it's just 
really what happened. One day uh, I was sitting on a bucket while Ada was brushing him because, you know, I could have brushed my other horses, but <laughs> I could sit on a bucket and visit with her while she's brushing him. And I happened to look down and notice that his sheath was really swollen. And so I went over and felt it just to make sure it wasn't hot or something, you know, that he had something wrong with them. And it was ice cold. I'm like really, really cold. And it wasn't ice cold outside. So I had, I went because I needed to compare. I went and checked all of our other gildings to see what they were, what they felt like. And they were all like body, body temperature warm. So that, that didn't make any sense. So I started, and I had, I had had body workers in my class in the past and they talked about scrotal adhesions, but I never really thought anything about it. But um, I started feeling up in his uh, sheath area where his gilding scar and everything was, and he had so many adhesions. And so I just started working them a little bit at a time, like, um, like rolling the skin and doing some different things like that for everything I knew. I'm like, I'm not a body worker, but I just did what I knew. And oddly enough, I'm like, as she started getting smaller and warmer and, and within probably, I'd say one to two months, his sheath was normal. And then his wear pattern on his right rear foot changed. I mean, it went back to symmetrical. It didn't have its weird wear that it always had. So I'll skip all the details because it's a really long story, but long story short, after all of this, and I talked to the previous owner, the one day that I was talking to her, the guy that she bought him off of uh, was there and he was like having a hissy fit because he bought Playboy to be um, a single footing racking horse he was the fastest racking horse he'd ever seen i'm like and he was unfortunately he was only two when he was doing all this stuff but um he had him gilded and he couldn't rack anymore after he gilded him. and so um and not only did they gild him but he got infected and they had to open him up twice to drain him which we didn't know any of that stuff that just compounds the issues but um but because i'm a little bit passive aggressive <laughs> um and i said well yep that was what it was you know because like you know, as the whole ride a two-year-old thing and racing him at a rack and stuff, I had to like dig that a little bit. So I said, yeah, he's, he could, I'm sure he could do that now. I've never asked him to do it. And so I did, I did tell Playboy, I said, let's just try this one time. I could care less if you ever single foot again, but if you could just do it one time. So I could tell this guy, you can single foot like nobody's business now. <laughs> and so um, he did, he single footed for me. He doesn't like to go fast, so I don't make him. What is but. single foot? It's a, it's a broken pace is what it is. So it's a super, it's like, it's a, the gated community likes to do that so they can race horses and it's a single footed rack. So all fat men. <laughs> Ada's not using her. So it's a broken pace. So it's a pacing <laughs> action, but it's still four beat. It, it's a broken pace. So like you, like it, you take out, uh, like you, you just slow down one foot by a fraction of a second and you have a broken pace that's a single footing rack and it's super smooth and you can get pretty fast. And Playboy was super good at it, but he didn't, Playboy doesn't like to go fast. And I, I promised him after I did that that day, I said, I just want to do it just so I can rub it into the guy that he would, you know, know that he, you ended up in a better place than racing other single footer horses. And he did it for me. And I said, that's the last time you have to do it, dude. So anyways, so with that said though, when I trim his feet, I actually, I watch for his wear patterns because if his wear pattern changes on his right rear foot, I know to check his, his uh, sheath again, make sure that he's not getting sticky. Wow. So those are little pieces like that. And but it's so an, it's so you're so lucky because you were able to actually find out the story and that he had had been opened up a second time and had an infection because most people don't have the luxury of actually winding up being able to talk to the person that gelded their horse. I was, I was really happy we found that out because yeah. I figured he had a rough time anyway with how many adhesions he had, but it made sense that he had that many after he had all the difficulties he had. Right. And unfortunately the, um, the veterinarians that gilded him, cause the guy, like the guy, like him and I like have our moments, but he did associate that he couldn't do that gate anymore after the gilding and all right. the vets told him it had nothing to do with it. And, um, and that's what was, he, he was so upset about. Cause I told him, I said, it had everything to do with it because, so this isn't playboy in the picture, but his shoulder looks, it looked just like that when he had the adhesions because his wear pattern was weird on his right rear and his left shoulder was overdeveloped. Wow. And so and it, it looked just like that. This isn't playboy, but it did look just like that. And his shoulders are even now. 
And wow. so, but I, I really pay attention to his wear patterns and his hind feet because, you know, they can still get more adhesions. I'm like, it's just like, it, it can happen. So I, if he starts to get a weird wear pattern, I start working his sheath again. Fascinating. Okay. So that's the other parts. And then, so body misalignments. So it's like where, where patterns can happen because, you know, their, their sacrum can be out their shoulder. Can, like they have chiropractic issues or, or muscular issues, just like we do. So yep. any of that stuff can be out. So, uh, so my, my job as a trimmer is to make the owner aware that they have a weird wear pattern. And then the owner and I will go over it together and we'll, when we'll take slow motion video and we'll, and, and most of the people that, that, um, that I trim for have all kinds of footage of their horses. And so we can compare how the, the horse was moving before the wear pattern changed. And then we can see if we can figure out where it's stemming from. And so I'm like, I always, I'm like, I'm a huge advocate of body work. I'm like, I always, I always want people to have body workers. Um, I'm an advocate of chiropractic as long as it's done correctly. Yep. And, um, and if, if something's going on, then they need to have check with their veterinarian also to make sure that there's not something else going on that we can't see. And then, uh, and then I'm a, I'm a huge person about teeth too. So I'm like, that's on the list too. It's like, so I think I may see what I got here. Put some stuff here. So, so before, uh, this is fantastic visualizations from the, as a, the horse and us.com. Um, they have some really cool stuff. And uh, if you go to that website, you can actually see this because they put this animated view of how a horse chews, but, um, but I couldn't get it to play when I did it. So, but you can see the circular motion, how they chew. And I think, I think teeth, like most of the people that I work with are well aware that teeth play a part on their wear patterns, but um, the general public still doesn't understand how much teeth play a part in how the foot hits the ground and how everything, I'm like, there's so much going on in the whole horse. So if you go to this website and check this, this visualization out, it actually shows you in motion how this, how horses chew. And the whole point with that is, is, um, let's see, I might have put, so this is off of their site too. So when you look at these uh, abnormal wares of these teeth wear patterns, and so it can be chicken or the egg with the horses. So it can be, it can start off in the teeth and it can start affecting the body. And then they start compensating with their body and causing weird wear patterns. Or it could be that they have something go wrong in their body and they start compensating and it actually will do that to their teeth. So there really is, there's really no other explanation to anything other than to know that every single thing that is encompassed in that whole horse's body is related to every single thing. So I would say it like this, any of these horses that teeth look like this will have weird wear patterns in their feet. And any horses that have weird wear patterns in their feet, even play both his uh, scrotal adhesions and the wear pattern that he had in his foot affected the wear patterns in his teeth because the horse uses their, their head as a counterbalance. And like, and everything is, everything is, it revolves around all of it. So does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions about that? Yeah, I, I, I pulled up the website. Um, well, maybe I pulled up the website. Um, so I'm going to pop it in the chat so that people can go and see the video there. Cause I've got the chewing video up. Uh, Isn't that a cool video? Yeah. Do you want to unshare your screen? I'll see if I can't share it right now. Yep. yep. Do, do, do. Oh, let me just close some of this other stuff. Okay. Share screen. Here. So here's there. I put the link uh, in the chat there, but here's the video of the chewing motion. I don't know if I can make it bigger. Let's, oh yeah, I can. Hang on. Let's see if I can center that a little bit. So can you all see that? It's like a circular motion, which makes me wonder if horses are left circular and right circular. Like I think I would that. wonder that too. Like, that would so much surprise me at all. Like elephants have a dominant tusk and a non-dominant tusk, right? And you can tell because um because they wear one down more than the other. Yeah. That, very cool. That's fascinating. So um 
I'm gonna go back to share my screen now. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, so when you see how the horse's jaw rotates to um, chew, anything. So look at any of these um, misalignments of the incisors, and there's no possible way that when they're when they're trying to do that, it's not it's not just about the chewing; it's about the way that they're moving. And if if they cannot do that um, as they're walking, they're going to have places that that catch and don't allow that full motion of anything that they're doing. So I, I'm kind of jabbering. That makes probably no sense. No, no. But, you look at these um, now that we've seen that motion and how it's a very circular motion. You look at any of these or. Uh, possibilities and you're going to see that that motion is going to be impeded because it's it's like with the slant i can see it the most easy in terms of the circle is going to be on an angle i'm really wondering how a smile and a frown shape are going to be able to chew in a circular motion because the teeth are going to not really allow it so a lot of those horses that I've seen, like, and I've worked on them and like, and they get weird wear patterns because those horses can't chew in a circular motion. So they chew up and down and it overdevelops their, their temporalis muscles. Uh -huh. So they've got this big, uh, big muscular forehead that um, before people know any different, think that they just have a lot of muscle and it's just improper chewing. Got it. So, um, so there's a lot of things, but any of these horses that do this, I'm like, it will actually cause their tmj to offset and if your tmj is offset you can't like it's hard to keep your balance like if, if any of us have a tmj issue or a, yeah. a catch on your tmj or anything that happens like that we can't we can't function correctly it's like like we're we're bipeds but you can't you can't you, you lose your balance easier when any of that stuff happens yeah, so i'm gonna so, i'm gonna bookmark this website because it's got a lot of interesting things there we have a lot of cool stuff. I'm like, I, and, and I've gotten to um, chat with them on email and I, I had asked them if they minded if I use some of their stuff. And I just, as long as I give them credit, they're cool. So, and like, it's a cool a website for anybody to go check it out. Cause they, um, if I'm not mistaken, one of them is a veterinarian and the other one is a, like a digital artist. So they, they can do a lot of this stuff. So, but this, so does that make sense to everybody? If there's yeah. any questions? Uh, yell out. Yeah. So um, then you have to, then when you're looking for wear patterns, you want to look for the balance within the hoof itself. So, um, so you want, you'd like to have 50, 50, like as far as like when you're looking at this, this hoof, like you have to have a good center of balance in your hoof. So you have a good center of balance in the whole body. So if you're missing something that's not balanced in all of this, my dog is in the background cheering. Sorry, she's okay. she's old and she thinks that it all revolves around her. <laughs> so um, so but if it's something is offset within this balance, then something else is off because that balance will affect the other balance. If that makes sense to everyone so far. So I think and the then, next slide. And then don't you have do you, okay? So the question is, do you have to take into consideration that no hoof is perfectly symmetrical? And what's, in other words, bone structure is going to affect the balance of a hoof. Absolutely. Right? Confirmation versus posture, right? Yes. Yes. So, so you have to take that into consideration when you look at this picture and you know you want a 50-50, but you pick up that foot and it's not. And that's because yes. of confirmation. Right. So... So this is this is this foot that's on the screen is everybody's um, this is everybody's goal goal model in their mind per se, um, and and you want to get as close to that as you can. My goal model and for me is what the horse says, because if you're going to look at and but you still have to have something to base something on. Yeah. But um, I'm not going to. I will. I will put it this way. I will never strive to make a horse like this at the expense of him having to compensate because he doesn't, he might need something just a little bit different. Okay. So, and there, does that make sense? Yeah. Because, the, you know, there's always that thing that happens when we start shooting for an ideal, but don't look at how it's affecting the whole system. 
Like we yeah. look at one piece and say, this is how we want it. I mean, I lost a horse that way. Um, so <laughs> yeah, <Great>. no, <laughs> I, I know. I'm like, so my, my biggest pet peeve about internet barriery is, um, and this, I like, and anybody that's taken a class knows I'm like, I'll go on a rant about this, but internet barrier will, and first of all, you can't really tell things for certain by pictures on, you can't tell things for certain by pictures, period, because like Yogi just had a little thing about switching the angle of a camera and seeing how much different it looks just by, just by how close you are to the object and all this stuff. But you can take a picture and, and I've seen people do this. I'm like, they'll put it up an x-ray and the x-ray is awful and the foot's awful. And so then they trim the foot and the foot's beautiful and the x-ray is beautiful, but they don't show a video of the horse walking. So if the x-ray is beautiful and the foot's beautiful, that really doesn't mean that much to me until I see that the horse is beautiful with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so, and, and that's, that's just, I'm, I'm a really, I get really on a, soapbox about that so, because I, so if i were to summarize then we have to have a sense of what the ideal is so that we have a, a compass that yes. guides us but then we have to look at what's in front of us yes that's perfect and okay. i'll probably steal that for another class Go for it. <laughs> so but yeah but you have to you have to know what you're striving for it doesn't mean that you're going to get there right you know, but you have to know where you're going so um so with that said, like, so when we looked at the first picture and we saw what a hoof should, you know, in a perfect uh, world look like, then if you look at this, this is how much that this, the long toes will distort the hoof. Okay. And so there's a point about this with the wear patterns, because as you watch this horse distort its foot, because of how long the toe gets, you're distorting that particular of capsule which also distorting something else in the body which is going to cause compensatory factors which will actually create odd wear patterns so does that make sense yeah so you have to watch the length of your toes I'm like and again i'm like i'm not going to whack any horse back to a said spot to satisfy a a, a a formula but you have to understand that if things are changing and they're changing for the not so good, you have to look at everything. So double check your toe length, see where you're at with that and see how balanced the foot is and balance for that horse. And so, and I could go into a whole bunch more of a tangent with like um, balance to the horse if your pasture and bones come in into um, offset center of the hoof capsule in the first place, because then you're going to have more weight on part of the hoof capsule. So that horse, this is why when I have my students balance the feet, they don't hold the hoof capsule in their hand to balance it. They're holding the, the limb and looking mm. down at the hoof capsule because you have to look at where you're going. Mm -hmm. So that part, so if you have long toes on a foot on your front feet, your back feet are going to have a hard time following through because there's still going to be too much of the foot left on the ground at breakover. So wear a pattern that you might see with that are horses that drag their hind feet, toes, they're dragging their hind toes because they can't follow through with the complete movement because it, the, basically the front feet are too, too long and in the way. I always compare it to walking behind somebody really slow in the grocery store that you possibly can't walk that slow. So you have to shuffle. And so what it amounts to is the horse is walking off on his front feet and he's shuffling with his back feet because he don't want to step on himself mm -hmm. or a slow person in the grocery store. <laughs> okay so then i put these three up here because these are three significant wear patterns that you would want to look at and understand so the first one a it's back to the symmetrical one this one's it's got no issues it's got no issues with the symmetry of the hoof i should say so b we've got long toes so the heel buttresses are going forward and so the, your heel buttresses on horses shouldn't go forward um more than the frog so like on a in a perfect world your heel buttresses should be lined up with your frog and notice that the bars the bars are still part of the hoof wall so the bars do whatever the hoof wall does so bars are hoof wall they're like they're not an, a separate entity the 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 lamina that goes with the bars is uh it, it goes right fluently with the lamina that goes with the rest of the hoof wall so it's still still all all hoof wall so if your if your toe is going forward, it pulls all that forward. So horses should always be with the frog. Donkeys and mules will be in front of the frog. That's that's part of what they do. But 
I see, I'm like, this is a horse that toes in. So the medial toe will be longer than the rest of it. And so you'll notice this is a hope wear pattern. And so then the, when that happens, notice that's connected. So when, if you have a medial toe flare that's happening on a horse that toes in, your the, the diagonal heel buttress will be going forward too. So you can mm. look at those wear patterns and start identifying those. And then you can just readjust the symmetry of that foot and put it back. You're not doing corrective, corrective trimming but you need to put it back into balance for the horse. The horse will continue to move how it always does if it's a true uh, pigeon-toed horse. But one way that you can tell a pigeon-toed horse versus a person that's trimming a horse into pigeon-toedness is if you hold the, the limb by the cannon bone, you hold it like you're looking at the foot, you got it picked up. And at the, the point, the apex of the frog points toward the midline, then it's truly a pigeon-toed foot. If your frog is still plumb, but you, your horse is still turned in, then it's usually a man-made. Not always, but usually a man-made thing. That's a good way to figure it out. So any questions for anybody? Wendy, you got any thoughts? I, I, this, this picture has been really helpful in terms of this distortion with C, with the idea that the frog, if the, because I have a little horse that, um, he gets distorted and I keep trying to figure out which way to go with him. He's a little turned out and stands, you know, he's, his knees turn out and he loads the medial side of the yeah. foot. And so, yeah. you know, I look at that foot and I'm always, and then he's club footed behind pretty much. <laughs> he's a <Yeah>. Welsh job. <laughs> oh, poor little dude. So, so, so somebody's asking, um, uh, about the plum, like, could you please, where is that? Could you please backtrack to that sentence? So you go talk again about when you pick up a foot, like C. Yes. If you pick up the foot, so we're going to assume it's a front foot, but if you're picking up a front foot and you picked up the foot and you hold the foot to sight it, you're looking at it to sight down the hoof, you're holding, you just hold the cannon bone. Don't hold the fetlock or the hoof. Because if you if you hold those two, you can you can change your like and I and I challenge you to just try this just because um it be it will help you to understand it even better. So start off with holding it by the cannon bone and look at the balance of your hoof and where everything is going. And by that, if the frog is straight up and down, it's plumb, it's a plumb line, like it's right to the ground, then that is not a that's not a turned in foot. But if, if the frog, the apex of the frog points towards the midline of the horse, so then that, that tells us that from the cannon bone down somewhere, there's a twist in the foot that's causing the frog to point towards the midline. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I'm wondering if I found a picture here. I, I wonder if I share this picture, if this might actually um, illustrate. And I'll put it in the same. Hang on, I'm going to turn it so it's the same direction as your foot um and tell me i'm if you want to share your screen i can share mine and you can tell me if this is what you're talking about because i think it is okay now that i have that idea of what i'm looking at so yeah i think that you have a hold of his his uh fetlock there though right but the, the idea that this heel's going forward and this toe is long here. Yes. With the, but when, with the frog basically being straight. Yes, but but this is where the problem lies, is because you have a hold of the fetlock. And holding the fetlock, you can put you can roll that fetlock up and, and have the hoof face me like that. And it doesn't say whether that is actually pointing in or not, because we're not giving it the freedom to flow. Got so it. if you'd back your head up and put it on the cannon bone and hold it by the cannon bone, then if the fetlock has a twist in it, the twist would appear and then the uh, frog would go, the apex of the frog would go inward. Got it. Does that make okay. sense? So, it, so it's really important. I see what you're saying, not to hold the fetlock. You have to hold it by the, so, because what we're looking for, because not all horses, but the majority of horses that are, um, that are pigeon-toed is usually a twist in the fetlock area. 
it's not always, but like it can be in the knee. So in that case, and that's a whole different thing, but you'd have a twist in the knee and you'd have to look at a different part of the body that way. But when we're looking at just the toed in horses that might be pigeon toed or toed in, it's generally in the fetlock area. Got it. So it won't show up if you hold the fetlock because then you're holding the, the fetlock straight and you're looking at the foot. Right. You're blocking it from actually showing you what's going on. Yes. And did that answer Jennifer too? Jennifer, did that help? Um, she said, yeah, she has a lippy mare that has a, that's pigeon toed and it's fetlock has a twist. So that makes sense. Okay, good. I'll get to meet her soon. Oh, this <laughs> is the we're first going down to in Florida that you're going to see. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Okay, I'll go back to my screen. Okay. Okay, so when those, when that happens like that, we're not going to try to correctively trim that but we would take off the toe flare. We'd bring that toe in and bring this heel back. And so that doesn't correct them, but what it does is it resets the balance so that as they wear and do their own wear pattern again, we're not adding to it. So if we leave it just like this, and I've seen this a billion times, if you leave it just like this, and this is what, if you just trim this foot, like you're trimming it lower instead of actually trimming it shorter. If you trim that foot like that, what happens is, is you're just lowering that distortion. You're not actually changing it. Mm. So then for the next, for the next uh, four weeks that you go for your trim, you already are started on a distorted path. And then the horse continues to do that. And so at the end of a year's time, this, this toe is going to be like further out like this, and this heel will be further forward and you'll have a worse twist. Got it. Okay. So the whole body connection, I put this on almost everything because like it goes back to the long toe, but again, for every centimeter of extra toe length, which is like not even a half an inch, it creates 110 pounds of pressure on the acting tendons. So whatever that, if, I, if you're having the long toe, like what that animated um, picture was of the toe getting longer, as that's happening, the longer it gets, you can almost do an animation throughout the body as far as like the pressure on the tendons that's happening. So. Mm. And that affects all the gates. So I have it like stated like that because depending on the work that you're doing, if you're doing mostly walk work, so it's affecting it at a walk. But if you start doing lots of canter work and you're doing a three beat gait, then more things are gonna, there's gonna be actually more pressure on, uh, it's less, it's not as dispersed as if you were doing a four beat gait, put it that way. Does right. that make sense? Yeah. And then if you've got a boot or something that's lengthening that toe out. Yep. Yep. So I'm like, I'm like in the hoof protection class and like, I just, we just did a whole section on that. I'm in November with the, the boots. And so I have the hoof model and then the boot that we put on it. And so we trace each of them. And then when you trace the, uh, the hoof model, and then you put the trace, the boot that you're putting on it, it, um, some of the even some of the best low profile boots still add a centimeter <laughs> so i'm like i go through and uh, bring that break over all the way back to where the on the underneath of the ground horse uh, place that it's the same as what the reg regular hoof is <clears throat> yeah, wow. it's so interesting isn't it everything affects everything <laughs> mm -hmm. i love the puzzle <laughs> I'm doing a hard one right now. It's the planet Venus. <laughs> yes, you're going to get it. Oh, yeah. It's, I like the hard puzzles. Yes. Okay, so the trots can be diagnostic. So the whole point about this, this is taken right off my, my class. But the point about this is, is if you see a weird wear pattern in one foot, you'll often see a weird wear pattern in the diagonal foot. So then you have to like put on your, your thinking hat and figure out like which wear pattern started the, which one started. Is it the hind foot? Is it the front foot? The, is, so it's just, it's just about questioning everything. Like you really have to question everything and you just can't make any assumptions because the only truest thing about a horse, you could bubble wrap them and make them and, and put them in a padded stall and they can still do something. So you still yeah. have to question everything. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's so true. And so then um, I wanted to talk about keeping records because um, this, when Alicia came out with this book, I, I'm like, I bought it as soon as she posted that she's selling it. But 
for you guys that are tracing your hoofs, like this book has got the best, best record keeping you could do for your horse. It's like, I'm like, I could do a whole thing on this book because it talks about watching your horses, how it's landing medially and making notes about it and, and scoring it and stuff and, and the diet and like anything and everything that would change, like dental, all the stuff I talked about. She's got this in the book that you can check off these things. I'm like, have you seen this book yet, Wendy? I, you know what? I, I knew she came out with it, but I don't, I realized I don't have a copy and I've been at, you know, at several places where she's been there and why I don't have a copy. I don't know. Cause I obviously need a copy. <laughs> it is, it is, it is the perfect record keeping book because it kind of hits on all the stuff that I just talked about. It's like it, like she has stuff in there. It's like, like when, if you have to rehab your horse and, and you go back to exercise and like, and, 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 uh, rating them for how, how they're moving and like, and are they hit, hitting media laterally, all the stuff that we talk about with hope wear patterns, like, and it's all right here in the book. So I can't really recommend it, uh, enough for keeping track of the, your hope wear patterns. And like, it's a, it's a perfect, um, addition to it. Cool. Yeah. I don't, yeah. No, I knew she came out with, it. I know it's been very popular. Um, yeah. But I guess I did. I guess I didn't realize that it was uh, to keep track because I'm just trying to think of when did my horse have his teeth done last because he's chewing really funny. <laughs> yeah. So so it, the I you have you guys. It's like I'm like I'm not trying to sell her book. I'm like I have the book, but I'm just saying that um it's the best it's the best thing I have seen at this point for um record keeping uh, your. Your your and it she's listed as a rehab guide, but it doesn't even have to be just for rehab. I'm like it's just keeping track of your horses, and it's just it's it's kind of fun to do, and it's just well thought out and well placed. So it's like I I think and that, that might um, be what I might it might have been because of the rehab part that I but yeah no that sounds like a great idea to have that as a uh, a guide. Maybe I'll have to get it and have it on my website so that when people order Surefoot pads, they can get get their their book to go with it yeah because um i think I, I can't remember if she mentioned i think she mentioned surefoot in there too but another thing so this is another it's a fun thing and like i meant to put a picture because i honestly like i was like like kind of rushing around getting all my pictures together to put this together because it was i didn't have a lot of like pictures. yesterday i said ida can you do this webinar yes <laughs> it wasn't even just yesterday it was like seven o'clock last night <laughs> well that's yesterday now <laughs> I, know, I know it's all good i'm like i had but so but i did forget to put my picture in it's really cool you guys is um so one thing you can do if you have wendy surefoot pads is um because i had somebody just ask me just recently uh because i asked them they was asking me a question about their horse moving and stuff and i said well it has his wear patterns change and they said i don't know because i have um i have glue on shoes on the hinds because they was worried about a hind foot i said um that's not a problem even if you have shoes on and like even it doesn't make any difference if it's glue on or not be careful with the metal shoes that you don't rip up anything but um but you can still even if you have shoes on you can't test your wear patterns you can um actually use the surefoot pads to do that and um it works out a little bit better if you cool get the pads that they're kind of cool the cooler they are the better they hold the impression but if you can put the pad on a horse that has shoes on you're trying to figure out something and like even if you um even if they're in glue on shoes for a few sets or like even regular shoes, it doesn't matter. But if they're on for a few sets, you can actually uh, put, you know, make impressions and take impressions of those um, in the pads. And you can actually keep track of your wear patterns, even if you have um, protective devices on them. Right. It doesn't matter. Boots, <laughs> barefoot, glue ons. Um, it still gives you, uh, I can throw up a picture of a, of a impression if you want. Yeah. Uh, yep. I meant to do that. I did because I, I had one from our Washington I've class. I've got one was, right here. I just had Dunny stand on pads the other day, and I was like, "Hey, look at that!" Uh, there we go. So he's barefoot, but you can see the difference in the shape of his two feet. Yeah, and so you can still keep track, even if you have your horse in, like you're, you're not able to see the wear patterns. You can still keep track by um, putting them on a surefoot pad, and then take a picture of it. And you can actually keep those. Like these are valuable. To yeah because it it get you know you can see the changes over time and i'm i'm gonna stop share uh, i'm trying to think if i have a picture of his wear patterns from before and 
uh, not something I can quickly pull up, but it's, it is a great way to just take a, a quick record, you know, and then you've got it. And then you can look back and go, uh, it's better. It's worse. It's no change. Somebody's asking if sure put, uh, let's see, let's see. I recently purchased, nope, the wrong one. Oh no. What are your thoughts on the workman black and or Metron technology? Um, so workman black, I'm like, is a blast. I'm like, we used that last year. We played with it at, um, the a our advanced professionals class and um it like i'm there's there's one coming in my future because there's it's fun i'm like it's 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 again you know there's nothing that the horse the horse gets the last say no matter what but it's fun to watch so for instance last year um like at the apc class we used the workman black uh program and their little are you familiar with them wendy no computer chips that go on the horse's hoof Ooh. and um they're there and um so then we could watch the um we can watch the footfall the flight the lo loading pattern and everything and so um we were working on a horse last year we've been rehabbing him he had torn uh his patellar ligament which was a career ending uh injury for him and um just pretty much uh pasture pet um pasture pet as well that they thought he was going to be able to be and so I've been working on him for going on two years and like adjusting his feet to help his patellar ligament heal. And so uh, at the APC class, yeah, those are, they're fun. And uh, at the APC class, we put those on his feet and we uh, just did a series of everything that we could do with walking him, checking his um, computerized version. And then, uh, so I adjusted his hind feet. Go ahead. I, I adjusted uh, his hind feet. So the one that had the, has got the torn ligament, um, I raised his angles and his foot um, quite a bit, like three degrees higher than his other foot so that it balanced his body out temporarily until he could, um, uh, so his ligament could heal better. And then, then we're in the process of like, we're getting down to about like a half a degree now, but we had him within, um, I think, two milliseconds of uh, same footfall timing by doing that with the, we could, we could trace that. So we, I could adjust him to two milliseconds of hoof, uh, footfall landing and uh, stride length by, um, I wasn't using, I could tell that with the workman black, I could tell that computer wise, but, but I could tell that what I was doing was working because it traced his footfall. That you know, I've been, I, they've been working on systems like this now for a while and there's been you know there's a couple of different things coming out and it, i'm so excited to see that we're getting this technology where we can actually measure things in the field as opposed to having to be in some lab with you know i mean it used to be like wires mm. and everything else so and this is awesome that we're getting because it's going to give us so much insight um you know it's it's really interesting. I was down at the Chi Institute for their um, CERPV training for the veterinarians that um, do a, a, the CERT training that Dr. Carla Pastor teaches down there. And I ran into um, Brent Barrett and I gave him a pair of the physiograph blocks, the ones we're now going to yes. call squishy pads that they're, they give to the horse's pressure. And it was so interesting to watch him during the day because he started with it and then he kept go using it with different horses and looking at the images. And then you could see his brain just ticking away, trying to figure out what do I do with this information and how does it change what I might do? You know, yes. and it's just, it's just yeah. another data point because, you know, all the surfaces, if the surface is, is soft, we don't see what the foot's really doing in the surface. If the surface is hard, then the, then the horse yes. has to adjust to the hardness of the surface and their hoof is going to change. Right. Well, that's what with the workman black. I'm like, it's very fascinating because um, it actually, um, as the foot is moving and landing and loading, it actually will take um, uh, all those readings, like all the all the readings in motion, and then it it lights up the foot where the the most pressure is at which point it's at. Like it's 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 so with any luck, like we'll um, we'll have um, it'll be back at the uh, advanced professional class in. Um, July in Illinois again this year um, we'll be playing with it and so um, like I think uh, I think my person will be able to bring it if I don't own one by then 
but <laughs> awesome. um, uh, what's Jennifer's asking something? It's I just see uh, it. super expensive, but maybe local ferry groups can pull together to, you know, because those, that kind of technology is not cheap. No, uh, they are expensive. Yeah. Okay. But you know, that that's the thing is you've got your really high tech way of figuring out where the pressures are. And then your low tech way of figuring out where the pressures are. And sure if it's kind of your low tech way. And that's what this, we're now calling it the squishy block. Thanks to Mr. Uh, uh, Dr. Barrett. Um, but you can see, you know, like I, I got a, I have a radiograph I can pop up and show what we were looking at. Um, to, to, because it, it was just really, really interesting to, um, oh wait, I got it. Where is it? Here it is. Um, in terms of, so, so let me see if I can make this, there we go. I can make it bigger so people can see it. So this is the horse on a wood block, right? And then this is the horse on the squishy block. And what you can see is how much this part of the foot just sank down in where, which it can't do on a hard block. Yep. So it just gives you um, another piece. So here he is using the squishy blocks, right? And radiographing. This is not the horse that, um, let me just stop share for a second. I'll find the horse that we were actually looking at uh, that the radiograph was taken of. Uh, where is he? Here he is. There we go. Um, and it was his left front foot, I believe, is what that radiograph is of. But what you can see is the horse can sinks into the block and therefore can find what he's looking for, right? And then, um, then when you take the radiograph. So here's here's it. This was a massive horse. This horse was so big. <laughs> he was a monster horse. He still fit on the blocks. Um, well, he is that, big. Oh, he was big. He was very big. Um, the owner wound up doing him herself because she, nobody would do her horse. So she was doing her trim herself. But you know, it's it, again, it's just another piece of data that we can see if we give the horse a soft surface to let his foot sink into what does he do with his foot? How does he distribute the load versus when you're on a hard block that doesn't allow that, right? Um, well, part of that for me is like, so when I see, and, and we talked about this at the uh, clinic that you did in um, Washington. So, cause the way that the one horse kept choosing to um, put just a part of his foot um, on the slant pad. So when I see like that kind of a, um, that straighten so if you go back to the x-ray again and you see um the joint spaces in the hard pad the the wood block versus this the soft the squishy pad um so that gives me a piece of information about things that we could possibly do um like either with a glue on or um different things that we can realign that horse's joint spaces or help him with his joint spaces because uh, what he's trying to, how he's trying to load versus how he's forced to load. Yeah. And it's, you know, like you have to look at, he's, he's squished in all the way around, but there's, there, there would be the, the line across. So, and, and I have to say that don't take this x-ray as uh, the be all and end all because, um, you know, using the, the block changes the height of the radiograph where the radiograph machine is. And so you've always got to take into consideration that the wood block was a different height and that sort of thing. So I'm not, I'm not, yeah. I'm not trying to read this x-ray and I won't, I can't read x-rays, but I can just point that out. Right. Well, <laughs> same, I, say, I know same with me too. I'm like, because, well, I, for one, I'm like, it goes back to the whole, um, uh, internet barrier thing, trying to adjust something by what you think you see. Right. And so you only, I, I would only want to do what the horse said to do in the first place, but, but you can see the difference regardless, you can see the difference in the joint spaces. And again, um, x-rays, cause I'm doing a class with, um, Dr. Tracy Colvin in, uh, Uvalde March 1st and 2nd, her and I are doing a class together. Um, because, Did I uh, need her at AAP, tall woman, blonde hair. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Oh, she, yeah. Her, yeah, her and I are doing a class together, um, March 1st and 2nd about, um, 
proper proper radiograph like taking proper radiographs reading radiographs like because um she is she's a smart cookie and so we're gonna we're gonna join yeah and that's you know all i'm trying to do is say that you know when we use when when we think a little bit more outside the box we can come up with things like you know um like this high-tech technology which is awesome and then low-tech technology that can also give us information that just you know what i saw with dr barrett is it got him thinking it got him thinking in a different direction doesn't mean he's not going to do what he originally thought but he's going to think about it from a different direction right and that's what we always want to do is yeah look at it from different different angles i know that's that's the fun part it's like and like tracy and i always like are like we we laugh about that because it's like i love the puzzle and she goes i don't like the puzzle <laughs> she wants to be able to just help everything right now and i'm like and i, and I want to help everything too but i like the puzzle i think it's fun to figure out because for every one thing that you figure out for one horse i'm like it could apply that to the thousands so it's like the puzzle's right. fun right. it keeps my brain from getting really fried and hard and not flexible anymore <laughs> no it's true so. it's absolutely true um and and i agree with you it's the the curiosity of what is going on here and how to look at it and different ways to look at it and how do you solve that one um is the fun of it, it it's uh it's the challenge so yes and so so to add one more thing about the high tech and the low tech to me part of the fun of that is is to use them together to see because that way it tells us what one is saying about the other so it's like you can take the highest tech and see what it says computer wise and you can take the lowest tech and see what it says surefoot wise and i'm just using that for an example for now but see if those two line up and then if those two line up and a horse lines up with them it's a trifecta yeah so if yeah. if if one doesn't line up as well as the other then the horse is a trump card yeah so awesome. i think that was I think that my la that was my last slide that I had about uh, Alicia's book because it was the perfect um, combination to have to keep track of your hoofwear patterns. Yeah, no, I think that's a great idea. I'm going to go out and and um and get a copy and talk to her about maybe carrying it on my website since it sounds like it's a perfect companion. Um, and uh, I'll keep I'll keep it up on my on my uh, desktop here so I remember to contact her tomorrow. She so yes, I just, it's always a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. And thank you everybody who's uh, come on the webinar. And of course, this and all the other webinars are posted on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. Ida has her own playlist. So if you're trying to find all of Ida Hammer's webinars, you can just go to the playlist and look for Ida Hammer and they're all there. Um, Woohoo! Yay! But we're, we're lining up some other guests. We have, I think, Dr. Latcher coming back next week, um, and I've been working on some other folks. Um, now that it's winter time, hopefully it's a little easier to get the guests to join us. And uh, you know, if there's anybody in particular you want me to try and interview, just let me know. You can email me at wendy at wendymurdock.com. I cannot promise they will join me, but I can always ask. So thanks everybody for tuning in, and thanks, Ida. It's great to great to see you again, and and uh, see that you're getting better. Okay. Thanks guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.